God, you are so good to us to require us to gather and do what we may not otherwise be inclined to do on our own. And you've given us consistent patterns for our own well-being and that enable us to grow spiritually, to be strengthened and edified by the truth. God, as we think again about sanctification, about our own uh, obedience and the work that you are doing in all of your children to make them more like Jesus, I pray that this would be a tremendous encouragement as we reflect on your work in us and our own labors alongside you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thinking out the deep implications of the gospel and applying its powerful reality to all parts of my life is a daily challenge and a daily adventure. Theologically, I understand that the gospel didn't just ignite my Christian life, but that it also, it's also the fuel that keeps me going and growing every day. My challenge is understanding how this works functionally. So here are a few questions I go back to all the time that help me make the connection between what Christ accomplished for me and my daily internal grind. Since Jesus secured my pardon and absorbed the Father's wrath on my behalf so that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, how does that impact my longing for approval, my tendency to be controlling, and my fear of the unknown? How do the life, death, and resurrection of Christ affect my thirst for security, affection, protection, meaning, and purpose. In other words, how does the finished work of the one exposed, ravaged, ruined, and resurrected for us satisfy my deepest daily needs so that I can experience the liberating power of the gospel every day and in every way? Thinking those things through, asking those questions, is the hard work I believe I'm called to, the kind of labor Paul speaks of in Philippians 2.12. I'm not saying the Christian life is effortless. The real question is, where are we focusing our efforts? Are we working hard to perform, or are we working hard to rest in Christ's performance for us? Those words were written by a pastor, a man who seems to have been enslaved to pride and lust. Just a few years after writing those words, this preacher was found to be unfit for ministry due to infidelity in his own marriage. Now, sometimes ungodly men preach great, life-changing biblical truths that are able to transform all of life. And at times, God is pleased to even use those ungodly men to say things that will change and strengthen the church. Uh, there's even an example of this in Philippians chapter 1, the book that we'll be in this morning, where Paul notes that some people preached Christ out of ill motive, from selfish ambition, and yet Paul says that he rejoices that Christ is preached, although he disapproves of the ill motives themselves. So sometimes truth is kept for a time in an impure vessel, and God, in his wisdom, for his own reasons, is pleased to use those for his own particular ends. But in this case, with this particular man, this was not the case. Truth was not coming in an impure vessel. Both what was being spoken and the man speaking the words were defiled. 
Were you able to catch the error in what you even just heard? Maybe you heard a lot of truth that resonated with you that sounded right. After all, it did mention quite a bit about the gospel, uh, about our daily need for strength against temptation. He even mentioned the need for the gospel and its implications in order to avoid sins, like needing approval from man and uprooting unrestrained desires that seemingly why he was writing those words was getting into. But those things that he's putting forward are actually good things to pursue. But did you catch what else it did say? What, what's wrong with the quote that you just heard is what seems to continue actually to be a significant problem in Christ's church today. The very problems with what I read continue to plague the church in our day. It's been that way. Uh, it, it has come in seasons where a lawlessness is promoted under the guise of gospel centeredness or under the guise of biblical truth of some kind or, or another. With what you just heard, you can summarize the error in a couple of observations. First off, it pits performance, what I do to obey God, against grace and the gospel, what God has done for me. It puts those things at odds and makes them seem like contrary pursuits, as if they can't go hand in hand. And those things are not actually at odds with each other, but that's how it seems. It, in a subtle way, for you as the reader or hearer, hearing those words, subtly pits those against each other as if they are not compatible. That's the first issue. The second error with what you just heard, because of the first, it then, of course, makes, uh, because of that error, it also downplays the essential role that you as the believer do play in your own sanctification. That came out at the, the very end of those words. The question was, was, uh, was phrased, the real question is, where are we focusing our efforts? Are we working hard to perform or, contrast, are we working hard to rest in Christ's performance for us? And hopefully, you're all thinking, well, both. Shouldn't I be doing both? And yes, you should. We all should. That error, drawing a distinction, uh, putting those two things at odds, what God does in me, what God has done for me through Christ and in the gospel, grace, apart from my effort, setting that at odds with what I must therefore do for God, not to be saved, but because God has graciously saved me, putting those things at odds is fatal to the faith of the believer. And many believers who picked up that book, who were pastored by this man for years, experienced the detrimental effects of embracing that error in his teaching. Our church isn't immune to those kinds of errors. We have and even still at times uh, members of Grace Bible Church can fall into those errors. Um, some of those things that are championed by those who claim that this is what it means to be gospel centered that this is a gospel-centered way of thinking about sanctification. Uh, even within our own body, we've been influenced uh, by that kind of teaching through books, through blogs, through podcasts, through personal relationships. In order to be conformed to Christ's likeness as God intends, we must have a right understanding of what God does in sanctification and what we must do in sanctification. In order to be conformed to Christ's likeness, 
it's essential, it's crucial that we have a clear understanding of both what God does and what we must therefore do. What is God's work? What is our responsibility? That question is foundational to any and all progress in Christian maturity. And just to be clear, knowing that, knowing the answer to that question in no way loosens our grip on Christ and him crucified. Highlighting God's work alongside what we do in no way loosens our grip on the gospel. To the contrary, it only strengthens it. If we know what God is doing in us and what he has required us to do and how to successfully accomplish what God is calling us to do, that rightly considered, rightly applied in your life, believer, will only strengthen your grasp on the gospel. It would only heighten your love for Christ, your esteem, your gratitude for what he's done in the cross. And so that's what we want to do this morning, that very thing from Philippians chapter two. So if you don't have, if you have your Bibles, you haven't opened them yet, go to Philippians chapter two, and we will zoom in on verses 12 and 13. Philippians chapter two, verses 12 and 13 are going to reveal two foundational factors for Christian obedience, two foundational factors for Christian obedience. Let me read our passage for us. Paul writes, so then my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, But now, much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. This passage unfolds for us two foundational factors for Christian obedience. As you go about seeking to obey the Lord, you can keep these two things always in mind. First, a clear obligation, a clear obligation spelled out for us in verse 12. A clear obligation is foundational for Christian obedience. Everything that I just read in these two verses orbit around one imperative. The one imperative in this passage, it is work out your salvation. And everything in the passage finds its relationship to that one central command. Work out your salvation. Notice what's not said in that command. Paul does not command work for your salvation, work at your salvation, work toward your salvation. But it's merely a working out of salvation. The gracious gift of God that he has extended to you, that you have received by his doing salvation, you have been rescued by him. We are commanded then to work that out. This means that salvation already given is being exhibited in the one working. This working out is the natural result, if you will, of receiving the gracious gift of God's salvation. This must be for every Christian worked out. This clear obligation, we should see it as that both clear and an obligation. 
This is an obligation because God who speaks with all authority now speaking through his apostle has given a command and every biblical command that applies to you bears that same mark, the mark of God's own authority. It's not up for debate. It's not as if you're obligated uh, to obey God apart from salvation, but once you've received his grace, grace somehow liberates you from obligations to God. It doesn't make, turn his commandments into simple encouragements. It doesn't transform his imperatives into suggestions. Certainly they come from an all wise and kind God and on this side of salvation, father and friend, but the commandments stand as commandments and they bear the mark of God's own authority. And so when he speaks and says, you must do this, gives the command work out. We are then obligated to work out our salvation. This is obligatory for all believers. Consider some features of this clear obligation. Consider first where it's coming from. The obligation is coming from a beloved apostle. Paul in verse 12, who says, so then my beloved, speaking of the Philippian church, they're not only beloved by Paul, but Paul is beloved by them. In chapter one, Paul writes in verse three, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. For I am confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ. This church loved Paul. We know that because in verse five, it says that they have been a part of his ministry, participating in the gospel with him from the first day until now. You can read about Paul's time in Philippi in Acts 16. This is where Paul was imprisoned and beaten wrongfully. So uh, this was after not having a place to even worship in a local synagogue. And so they go to pray, run into some women whom God works in those women to transform them. And he begins the church in Philippi while they're in jail. Paul and Silas sing to the Lord. God frees them, opens the jail and they preach the gospel to the Philippian jailer prevent him from taking his own life. That was the beginnings of the church in Philippi. And that church, so indebted to Paul, loved him, had such a strong affection for him, they supported the apostles' ministry. Paul even reminds them in chapter 4, verse 10, so the letter begins in close to the end of the letter, In verse 10 of chapter four, he says, he rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. And then he records in verse 15, you yourselves know Philippians that at the first preaching of the gospel, after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone for even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once. And so this church was indebted to Paul and Paul likewise was indebted to them for their participation with him in the gospel. They loved Paul. And so the command when it came to work out their salvation did not come from a 
tyrannical, overbearing, authoritarian apostle waving his authority or holding his authority over the Philippians. That's not why he commands them in this way. Paul is beloved by them. And so this is reciprocated even in the command. This is this command comes, this clear obligation comes from a beloved apostle and it goes to a beloved audience in the Philippians. He calls them that my beloved. The church loves Paul. Paul loves this church. And so when he gives this command, it is with that understanding in mind. By implication, commands ought to be from love. They ought to extend from love, from love. If you love someone dearly, you don't do that by not commanding them, not laying on them obligations that God gives. Parents, you know this, when you tell your child, don't do that, don't run across the street, don't cross a parking lot without holding my hand. You don't tell them that because you hate your child. You do it because you love them. And so commands ought to extend from love. Uh, Wise disciplers do command those that they're discipling out of love. It ought to be out of love. This clear obligation came from a beloved apostle. It went to a beloved audience. And notice in verse 12 that it came with a previous pattern as well. The clear obligation had a previous pattern because as he commands them to work out your salvation, that modifying phrase at the beginning that comes before the command is just as you have always obeyed. They were to do this. They were to work out their salvation, have this pattern of acting like someone who's been saved, letting the salvation that God had extended to them have its work in their own lives, in their conduct, in their godliness, just as they had always obeyed. So the working out of the salvation is parallel with their previous obedience. They had, they already had a pattern of doing this, of working out their salvation in the particular ways that Paul describes, just as you have always obeyed. They were not to lose sight of former manifestations of obedience Rather, not losing sight of those things, they were to continue practicing those same obediences as the very fulfillment of the command, as the obedience of working out their salvation with fear and trembling. They were already doing this. He urges them on to continue doing the same thing. This clear obligation, furthermore, Paul wanted this working out of their own salvation that was to be done with fear and trembling. He wanted this to be apart from earthly influences. He wanted this to be apart from any earthly influences. He doesn't leverage temporal comforts or ease to compel them to obey this important command. How do we know that? Well, he, we know this because just as they had already established a pattern of obedience formerly, he continues and says, not as in my presence only, not as in my presence only. He doesn't say, if you love me, Philippians, then obey this command. Work out your salvation. It's not because Paul was there that he was requiring this. And certainly he was there setting an example uh, for the believers. He even reminds them 
of this in chapter four. He can say in chapter four, verse nine, the things you have learned and received and heard and seen. There were things that Paul taught that they received, that they heard, that they had seen in Paul's own life from Paul's own mouth. And he can say, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. But that is not the ultimate motivation for the Philippians working out their own salvation. As in my presence, the way you obeyed, you ought to. But not just that, because he says, now much more in my absence. So the obedience of the Philippians was to look the same. The working out of their salvation that they had already been practicing was to look the same, whether the apostle was present or not, whether he was with them or not. And isn't that just how you want obedience to be practiced in your home? Don't you wives want your husband's conduct to be the same with you as without you? Unless with you is not good, but you get the point. You want him to be the same godly man in your presence as he is when you're not around. And husbands, you want the same things from your wives. The same woman that I know and love at home when I walk in the door is the same woman when, I'm, when I walk out the door, when I leave home. You want your children to do this? And you even teach them knowing that you can't always keep an eye on them. So what do you do? You strive to instill convictions in them and the fear of God that will be a restraining influence in them. Even when you're not there, you want them not to be most aware of your own presence, but the God who is omnipresent, all present, present everywhere. So that it doesn't matter whether mom or dad around who cares. God's there. That's Paul's motivation as he describes this working out of their own salvation, as he describes, commands their obedience. He has in mind not his own presence primarily, but even when he's absent. And he says now when he's absent. So this included that additional requirement, that present requirement now. Why? Because he's not there. That's why he's writing a letter. He's not with them. So now, much more in my absence when I'm away, you must do this. You must work out your salvation. You must do this as you have always obeyed. So the fact that Paul was absent, it added a requirement. It included this additional requirement Uh, It included a present requirement because he's not there. And it actually heightened the requirement because he says much more, much more. What's the much more? Why much more now that I'm gone? Well, perhaps someone in Philippi, to speak hypothetically, could have thought, man, when Paul's around, I got to be on my P's and Q's. He is, after all, the apostle to the Gentiles. He founded this church. I got to be on my P's and Q's. If I, if I say something in error, I'm going to hear from Paul. If I act in a certain way around him, crack a certain joke, I got Paul's watchful eye on me. Well, the sincerity of the person in that position with that disposition toward Paul, their sincerity doesn't actually demonstrate itself to be sincerity until Paul's gone, until the motivation to conduct himself in a certain way is actually removed because the apostle left town to go on church planting. So sincerity now has an opportunity to shine without Paul. That's why now much more you must do this. The earthly influences, the earthly motivations the restraining influences on a temporal level, level, now that Paul's gone, are removed. And so Paul says, 
even more so, you must do this. You must work out your salvation with fear and trembling. If you want to know who you are truly, just consider the moments when no one else is around. That's how you know who you are most truly, most deeply at the heart level. The thoughts that you let pass through your mind, the motivations that you allow to motivate you, the desires that are hidden that no one else will know about, the things that you embrace in the secret places is who you really are. That goes for everybody. And sometimes that leaks out when we open our mouths, when we go certain places, when we are around certain people, etc. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. But who you are most truly is in the secret places. And so when the earthly restraints, when the earthly motivations and influences are gone, who are you? Paul desires that the Philippians work out their salvation on that level under those conditions. When your pastors aren't around, when your spouses are not in the room, when your parents' children are not there, do you obey the Lord? Externally and internally, do you bring your thoughts in submission to God's thoughts? Do you bring your desires in submission to God's desires? Do you correct your own motivations when nothing else is present to compel you? Just the glory of God alone. Is that enough? That would be an excellent test of whether or not we are true are sincere in our heart in obeying the Lord. Richard Sibbs, a Puritan pastor, wrote, Obedience is most direct when there is nothing else to sweeten the action. That is when obedience is most direct when there is nothing else to sweeten the action. Notice that this all important command was supposed to be carried out in a certain manner. And it is with fear and trembling, trembling with fear and trembling Two similar words that stress the severity and sobriety with which this command must be put into action. It must be carried out in this way. And obviously if you if you get everything that he said thus far, the gravity of being the same in secret at the heart level, at the level of your desires, etc. Then, then you get doing this with fear and trembling because that's only God sees there. No one will be sanctified who does not fear God, who does not tremble at his word. Why? Because they'll always be motivated by something other than God himself. If, if nobody else can see me or if I delude myself into thinking no one sees, then I'm okay with sinning. If I don't think that I'll get caught because God, the ultimate judge, is not in my mind, then I'll do whatever the sin is that I'm enticed by. This must be done with fear and trembling. All obedience ought to be carried out this way. Turn to Deuteronomy 4. We get this same idea, the same, the same language used in Deuteronomy 4 as Moses reminds the people what they saw or didn't see on the mountain. This fear and trembling includes, uh, necessitates a reverence for God and his voice. That's what's in view here. Deuteronomy chapter four, verse 10, or I started verse nine. Moses urges the people only give heed to yourself and keep your soul diligently. Where's Moses aiming? He's aiming at the heart, the inner life, the soul. Keep your soul diligently 
so that you do not forget the things which your eyes have seen and they do not depart from your heart all the days of your life. But make them known to your sons and your grandsons. Remember the day you stood before Yahweh, your God at Horeb, when Yahweh said to me, assemble the people to me that I may let them hear my words so that so they may learn to fear me all the days they live on the earth and they may teach their children. You came near and stood at the foot of the mountain and the mountain burned with fire to the very heart of the heavens, darkness, cloud and thick gloom. Any person would have trembled and that is exactly what happened. He was putting the fear of himself in him or in them rather as he spoke. Verse 12, then Yahweh spoke to you from the midst of the fire You heard the sound of words, but you saw no form, only a voice. So he declared to you his covenant, which I commanded you to perform. That is the Ten Commandments. And he wrote them on two tablets of stone. Yahweh commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and judgments that you might perform them in the land where you are going over to possess it. God intends his people to fear him when he speaks. This fear, this trembling accompanies, ought to accompany every act of obedience. Just as we heard from Deuteronomy 4, even instructing their children to obey God, this was with the fear of him instilled in them as he spoke. This, uh, this fear, this trembling, if you keep God ever before you, as you pursue obedience to God, the fear, the trembling that we ought to embody as believers constrains us from doing this very command, from working on our salvation with a self-confidence or an arrogance or a lightheartedness. No person who embodies this fear and trembling lightly leverages a passage like Romans 8, 1 and says, there's no condemnation. I'm all right. I don't need to be careful how I walk. There's no condemnation for me. I don't need to nitpick about obedience and sin and give so much strict attention to my heart and my life. There's no condemnation for me. That is not fear. That is not trembling because it takes God's grace for granted. And it even presumes on what God is doing and says, even if I do fall into a sin, there's no condemnation for me. I don't need to be meticulous about God's commandments. That's a disregard for his authority. The fear and trembling that we ought to have will keep us from having that kind of attitude. It'll keep us humble. John Calvin said in regard to to this idea of fear and trembling, we know from experience that all who confide in their own strength grow insolent through presumption and at the same time, devoid of care, resign themselves to sleep. How they think about obedience is easy, sleep, kick their feet up. He says the remedy for both evils is When distrusting ourselves, we depend entirely on God alone. And assuredly, that man has made decided progress in the knowledge, both of the grace of God and of his own weakness, who aroused from carelessness, diligently seeks God's help with or while those who are puffed up with confidence in their own strength, They must necessarily be at the same time in a state of intoxicated security, he calls it. This command cannot be taken lightheartedly. Does that severity, does that fear and trembling make us morbid, 
overly introspective, joyless Christians? Absolutely not. If you're familiar with Philippians, you know this. Paul, as we've already seen, he prays, offers prayers, chapter 1, verse 4, with joy in every prayer for the Philippians. The very one who's commanding this kind of sobriety as you pursue obedience has tremendous joy. And he doesn't give this command to be a downer. The fear and trembling does not remove joy, but according to chapter 4, verse 4, it can be done in conjunction with rejoicing. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. As you work out your salvation, rejoice. As you fear, rejoice. As you tremble, rejoice. It does not remove joy. It enables it. Fear and trembling. What, what might a practical outworking of working out salvation with fear and trembling, how might that manifest itself in real time? Just putting ourselves back in the Philippians position. What was Paul expecting as he commanded them to keep obeying as they already had been doing and to continue laboring to work out their salvation with this fear and trembling? The answer to that question is actually contained in the book and every other command that Paul gives. Here's what that would have looked like in Philippi. It looks like love abounding more and more in real knowledge and all discernment. Chapter one, verse nine, working out our salvation with fear and trembling means approving the things that are excellent. Chapter one, verse 10, it means being sincere and blameless. Chapter one, verse 10, it means being filled with the fruit of righteousness. Chapter one, verse 11. It means participating, supporting those who are in ministry, who are missionaries. Chapter one, verse five, chapter four, 15 to 18. That's what it, a part of what it means to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It means praying for persecuted and or imprisoned and or needy believers. Chapter one, verse 19. It means conducting oneself in a manner worthy of, of the gospel, chapter one, verse 27. It means boldness and peace in the face of persecutors, chapter one, verse 28. It means standing firm in unity with the church, chapter one, verse 27, chapter two, verse two, chapter four, verses one and two. Working out our salvation in fear and trembling means doing nothing from selfish ambition or empty conceit but instead regarding others as more important than ourselves. Chapter two, verse three, it means not looking out for our own interests, but for the interests of others. Chapter four, verse or chapter two, verse four, it means displaying Christ like humility. Chapter two, verses five and following. It means doing all things without grumbling or complaining. Chapter two, verse 14. It means, as we've already seen, rejoicing. Chapter 2, verse 18, verse 29, chapter 3, verse 1, chapter 4, verse 4. Working out our salvation with fear and trembling means being on guard against threats to God's church. Chapter 3, verses 2 and following. This also requires that we continue to live by the same standard that we've already received. This is essentially building on former principles and practices for continued obedience. Chapter three, verse 16 and 17. It means being a peacemaker in the church. 
chapter four, verse three, to help those who are in conflict. Working out our salvation with fear and trembling means possessing or keeping a gentle spirit. Chapter four, verse five. It means being anxious for nothing. Chapter four, verse six. And this means thinking on what is true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, of good repute, excellent, and praiseworthy. Chapter four, verse 18. It means imitating those things as we see them in one another. Chapter four, verse nine. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. The second and final foundational factor for Christian obedience is not only to know a clear obligation, but finally, number two, a divine motivation a divine motivation. The divine motivation, this has in view the one working and the work being done by the one who's working in us. Look at verse 13, four, four. He is giving a motivation for why to work out your salvation, why to continue pursuing the obedience that the Philippians had always practiced because for it is God who is at work in you. That's the motivation. That's the reason do this because it is God who is at work in you. That can also be read. Uh, work out your salvation with fear and trembling because The one working in you is God. The very one working in you is God himself. His identity, God, the one working, the God of the universe, the one who created in the beginning, the heavens and earth is working. The one who finished working on the seventh day in creation continues to work in you, believer. That's why we work. And the one working, Paul spells out what his activity is. Work. He's working. His activity is described as labor. It's it's foolish to think that God is at work in you to do something other than work. We were created for good works. God is working. What would give the Christian the thought that he's not obligated to get to work obeying God? That's that idea is foreign to scripture. God is working. Therefore we must work. Jesus said, my father is working until now. So he's working. We get the pattern in Christ himself. Again, not laboring so that he will save us, perhaps. Leave that for Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, and Muslims. To labor and show up before God hoping to be saved, that's not, that's not genuine Christianity. That is not who God is. He has saved us, and he is at work in us. And because he is the one ultimately at work in us, causing us to work, then we work. That is the motivation. God himself is working. And in particular, what is this work being done? What is God laboring at work in us, causing us to do? That author that I started this equipping hour reading, he said in the quote, The work that God's doing in me is merely making me appreciate the work that he's already done for me. Clearly, that's not what's in view. That's nowhere. That idea is just completely foreign to everything that's been said thus far. As surely as God is working to grow his people in their appreciation for the gospel to grow his people in a knowledge and gratitude for the finished work of Christ. 
He is, the verse says, working in you both to will and to work. That's what God's doing in you. Working, causing you to will and to work. Will and work. That's what God's at work in the believer to do. So if you wanted to know, is God at work in me? Look no further than your own will and your work. Do you will what God wills? Of course, that must be insincerity. Do you will what God wills? And do you work what God requires? You don't need to look at wrong indicators, things like how you feel about the gospel, how you feel about God. That is not an indication of whether or not God is at work in you. You could be deceiving yourself when you feel excited about the gospel. If music moves you in a moment, that's no indication of the Spirit's work in you, God's work in you. You could be caught up. You could have had too much coffee at the coffee table. And so your motion's all over the place. It's possible. This isn't whether God is at work in your life or in you is not. Your bank account, obviously, is no indication whether that's the case. Uh, the church you go to is not necessarily foolproof evidence of whether God is at work in you. You could be here because, again, the coffee's good. It is. Right, Matt? <laughs> you could be here for all kinds of wrong motivations. Uh, there are, are single women here. Some people have been here for that reason. Um, my friends go there. My family goes there. Uh, I like the, the, the fellowship. All, all wrong motivations. And you could say, because of those things, because I'm at Grace Bible Church, clearly God's at work in me. No? If there can be false converts in Jesus' 12 apostles, then certainly there can be here. Willing and working what God requires is how we know whether God is at work in us. And notice, don't, don't miss that that's the actual location of his work in you, in y'all, Philippian believers, in the church, in the, the, the members of the church. That's the location of God's own work. It's in you. And for his good pleasure. The goal of all of what God is doing uh, aims there for his good pleasure, for the good pleasure of God. What ultimately pleases him is why he is at work in us, causing us to will and work, to want and to do what pleases him. And it is in that, that sanctification finds its ultimate end, just like everything else. Everything exists for the glory of God for the pleasure of God, for what he finds right and good. It exists. Everything under heaven and the heavens themselves exist for God's purposes to display his greatness. And so similarly, the work that he's doing in us is for his good pleasure. And so these are things to labor after. Because God is good, because God is great, because he is glorious, because he is graciously at work in us, we must find that a compelling motivation then as believers to sprint hard and fast and forever toward his good pleasure. God, thank you for these truths. These are such foundational, just rudimentary principles for us to be thinking about as believers, to have our sights squarely set on you and your pleasure and to just respond in the only reasonable way, as Romans 12 says it, our reasonable worship 
our spiritual service is this very thing to merely present ourselves as living sacrifices to you because of your great mercies to us. I pray that you would heighten our love and admiration for Christ and him crucified so that as you do, we would rightly marvel at your kindness to us and be compelled to submit ourselves humbly and eagerly, willingly to your good and faithful commands. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.